Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 142. Have you ever wondered how the internet works? I mean, we're using it all the time. We do a lot more of our research online than we ever have before. Have you ever wondered how the data from your computer actually makes it to another computer somewhere else around the world? I found a very, very cool video that manages to explain a very complex process that happens really in a matter of seconds in a way that actually makes a lot of sense. And yet, while it makes sense, after I watched it, I uh, it was almost harder to believe that it really works at all because it's so amazing. Even if you are typically a person who doesn't bother to click on videos online, you got to check this out. It's called How Does the Internet Work? It's very short, just a couple of minutes. It's in the newest edition of the free Genealogy Gems podcast email newsletter. And I tell you, this video is very cool. Now, the newsletter itself is packed full of gems. Uh, if you aren't receiving your free copy, then you either need to go to genealogygems.com and enter your email to sign up. Or if you've already done that, but you haven't been receiving your newsletter, there's a good chance that it's suffering from a case of mistaken identity. That is that your email service might be mistaking the newsletter for spam. And the way around that is to check your spam folder. And when you find it, mark it as not spam. And then also add our email address, which is genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com to your email contact list. And that should take care of it. That kind of signals to your email provider that it's okay to receive emails from our address um, because you're not going to want to miss the upcoming issues. We've got a lot of great gems coming up in the newsletter in the coming weeks. So now that you're going to go check out that video, you're going to find out how the internet works. Then now let's talk about what in the world is going on in the world of genealogy. A lot of it's happening online. Some of it is offline, um, but it's been very busy. It's October 2012, and that means that it's Family History Month. Now, first of all, once again, I am an official blogger for Roots Tech 2013. It's the big and getting bigger genealogy conference. It's going to be held once again in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's going to be March 21st through the 23rd of 2013. Now, make a special note of that date because it's actually a little later than it's been held the last couple of years, which might be good as there may not be as much snow on the ground as we've seen in the past. But I don't know. You never know about that with Salt Lake City. Um, but what a wonderful place, of course, to attend the conference with the Family History Library just across the street. I hope that if you are planning on attending that you get in on some of my classes. I'm going to be there teaching again this year four classes. And I will also, once again, have a booth in the exhibit hall. So you got to come by and say hi, of course. And if I can squeeze it in, it's getting harder. <laughs> There's so much going on. Um, I'm hoping to do a few more videos for my Genealogy Gems YouTube channel from the exhibit hall. We've got our, our media booth. I call it the cone of silence, <laughs> although it's not totally silent in there. But it's right smack in the middle of the exhibit hall. And actually, it's going to be an easy way to find my booth this year because my booth is right next to the media booth um, where we're going to be doing all our video recordings. So you got to check us out there in the exhibit hall. And speaking of videos, I was watching the new promotional video for Ritz Tech 2013, which just came out, and I caught a glimpse of myself flying past the screen. It's a cameo. It's a really short cameo. Don't blink. It was of me teaching a class at last year's event. And I got to tell you, seeing all the action again from 2012 really has me excited for 2013. It's going to be great. Now, if you want to get in on the fun and the genealogical action that's going to be happening at Roots Tech 2013 this year, now is really the time to be getting signed up because some of the specialty workshops and labs are already filling up really fast. Can you believe it? In fact, they actually just added a second time slot for my Google Earth for genealogy class because the first one sold out shortly after they opened it up for registration. And uh, we are going to have some fun in that session, let me tell you. 
So here's what you need to know. They're going to have something for absolutely everybody. I think they're doing a really great job of expanding and really trying to provide something for everybody, whether you're high tech, whether you're first and foremost a genealogist, young or old, doesn't matter. And according to their recent press release, it says world-class speakers from all over the country will address the latest topics and challenges and there will be an exciting exhibitor hall with hands-on labs and demonstrations from 100 or more product and service providers. Attendees can choose from over 250 classes to learn how to start their family history, solve personal research problems, and find better solutions for connecting with their family. So here's the breakdown. You can do a full three-day pass. Now, up until December 31st of 2012, you can get that for $149. That's a full three-day pass. You can also do a full one-day pass for only $89. Uh, There's a student three-day pass, which is wonderful, making it so much more affordable for young people. If you have a school ID, it's required, you can get that three-day pass for $39. And they do have a getting started three day pass. It's an early bird special. It's $39. Um, there's also a getting started one day class. And I think there's some specific guidelines around what that covers. Uh, check it out their website. But the one day pass is $19. It's a selection of kind of fundamental classes for just getting started in family history research. And they, again, will have a developer day class encouraging folks in the technology field to join in. It's a full-day technology program for developers, and it's $89. So for beginners, if you're you're new to genealogy and wondering about being able to go to a conference, they're going to have a lot of things that really meet you where you are. They're going to have learn the basics of starting your family history, discover 10 activities that you can do to get started get hands-on experience with family history tools, and they'll have additional classes for LDS church members to learn the importance of family history, the basics to start your family tree, and so on. And for experienced genealogists, and I know a lot of you listening also fall in that category, you can attend hands-on workshops and interactive classes. That's probably one of the coolest things, besides the exhibit hall, about Roots Tech. They really put an emphasis on hands-on workshops. And and that's not an easy thing for a conference to do because it means having all of that workspace, the internet, the computers available, but they really pull it off in a great way. Um, These workshops, interactive classes, you're going to be able to expand your skills and knowledge to accelerate your research, help influence the future of genealogy, learn and share new ways to adapt technologies to genealogy, Help leading edge technology providers better understand your needs, have that kind of head to head conversation with the developers. And you can do that by participating in panels, product demos, and many other networking opportunities. And if you happen to be on the developer side as well, Developer Day is going to be Friday, March 22nd, in 2013. And those sessions are specifically designed to help developers explore the latest development techniques using cloud computing, mobile apps, social networking, geomapping, um, learn practical software development skills from industry leaders and pioneers, create solutions to difficult problems in a rapid growing market segment, and access sponsors, vendors, and exhibitors that provide tools and services to enable innovation. So I will have all the details for you in the show notes for this episode, number 142. Of course, you can always find the show notes for the um, podcast episodes. Go to genealogygems.com, click podcast episodes in the menu, and then you just follow the links. We're going to head to number 142 for this episode. And of course, we'll also have all that detail um, at the Genealogy Gems news blog at genealogygems.com. Also, um, I blogged recently a little post called Money Growing on Trees, Ancestry, Buying and Selling. Uh, the world's largest family history resource, of course, is Ancestry.com. And they are awaiting a possible buyout while they are keeping busy buying other companies. Uh, just the other day, Reuters announced that Primera Advisors LLP has emerged as the front runner to take Ancestry Private in a deal that could exceed $1.5 billion. Um, I've got a link for you in the show notes taking you over to a, a full article on that at PE Hub website. 
And uh, also, this last week, Ancestry released the following press release about the company's latest acquisition, which is San Francisco-based 1,000 Memories. Now, you can learn more about 1,000 Memories by listening to my interview with Michael Katchen. He's the Director of Business Development at 1,000 Memories, and that was in Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 119. Um, They are a San Francisco-based startup here just in my neck of the woods. They've been focused on helping people digitize and share, gosh, an estimated 1.7 trillion, with a T, (laughs) paper photos. Photos that people have stored in their albums, their attics, and their shoeboxes. They were founded not long ago, 2010, and their mission has been to help families and friends preserve their personal memories to share with other people. And a thousand memories will provide ancestry.com members with um, a new and compelling way to share their family history discoveries with friends and family, as well as scanning your old photos, adding them to your family trees. And uh, the thousand memories acquisition also brings with it the popular shoebox app, which you may have heard about, particularly if you have an iPad or a smartphone. Um, the shoebox app turns mobile phones into photo scanners providing a really easy way to digitize, save, and share photos online or while you're on the go, kind of like a little handheld scanner. The Shoebox app has been downloaded over 500,000 times since it launched, and it's become a pretty popular way for people to get old photos out of their shoeboxes or the shoeboxes of a relative and up into the cloud. So if you want to read more about that, I will have links for you in the show notes. Lots going on there. Boy, they don't they don't sit, do they? <laughs> stay pretty busy. And also, if you're looking for a way to stay busy, there's a job opening, a job opening in the field of genealogy. It's with SAR, Operation Ancestor. The position is for an Operation Ancestor Search Project Manager. And this is going to be based at the headquarters for the National Society Sons of the American Revolution, which is SAR. It's located in Louisville, Kentucky. And you can learn more about that organization at SAR.org. Um, Operation Ancestor Search is a project that was started with the D.C. chapter of the SAR, working with returning vets at the Walter Reed Hospital. And SAR members volunteer at hospitals and work both with the vets and, in some cases, family members on helping Um, Soldiers focus on something other than their injuries by using genealogy as that tool. And the program's official sponsor, Ancestry.com, partnered with the SAR from the very beginning to provide wounded warriors with resources through their online and software services. So a pretty cool project. Um, Interesting position if you are looking for a way to make a career out of genealogy. This may just be it. Um, I will, again, have all the details for you in the show notes. And, you know, we've talked about Google Books, of course, in the past and talking about, you know, using it for family history, all the wonderful old books that are digitized in Google Books. And, um, you know, with more than 20 million books digitized online, Google Books really is an amazing resource for genealogy. So much so that I devoted an entire chapter to it in my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox. However, Google Books has kind of been under the cloud of a lawsuit from publishers and authors, um, some of whom say that Google's digitization project violated their copyright. Because as you know, Google might go into a a repository, a library, start digitizing old books, and, and then there becomes a question about, well, who really owns the copyright for that? And publishers and authors definitely sat up and paid notice. And of course, there's always been concern that that could jeopardize the future of Google Books. But the good news is that this last week, the Association of American Publishers and Google announced that they have reached a settlement to end a lawsuit filed by five publishers back in October of 2005. So publishers will now be able to choose which books are included in the project. Um, I don't think that Google settles that often. (laughs) That's the impression I get anyway. So um, this is big news. And thank goodness, because it just kind of clears one of those obstacles out of the way. Um, I learned about that at the usatoday.com website. And I've got a link for you to a full article on that if you're interested in the show notes. 
And um, the other thing that's been new in the last week or so is, of course, Genealogy Gems premium podcast episode number 92. Now, old maps, you know I love them. They can tell us so much more about our ancestors than just where they lived. You know, they put events into geographic context, revealing surprising genealogical clues at times, and they can be incorporated into programs like Google Earth, absolutely free for analysis and storytelling. It used to be pretty difficult to find old maps to use in your family history research, but it's gotten a lot easier these days. Libraries and archives are digitizing them and they're putting them online. And in our latest Genealogy Gems premium podcast episode number 92, I'm going to tell you about a terrific example of a website that has set the goal of having every image that they possess allowable by copyright digitized and on their website by early 2013. This is going to be one to watch. And um, also in episode 92, I'm going to be telling you about something pretty shocking that happened to me recently while speaking at an international genealogy conference. I was really taken by surprise and received some very unexpected questions from the audience. And I'm going to share those with you as well as some very solid answers that I think that you can use for your genealogy as well. So it's a packed episode. Um, if you are a member, you just go into genealogygems.com, sign in there in the center column of the website, and that'll get you access. You know, nowadays, things have changed. Premium members, they have access to the whole back catalog. So that means there are 92 episodes, premium episodes with all the show notes available at your fingertips as a resource. And, you know, sometimes you need stuff at a certain time and not at another time. So um, this way, you really have this full library of information and interviews and audio to listen to, to help support you in your family history research, as well as videos. We've got lots of great videos on there. In fact, um, some of my most popular classes have are available as videos as part of Genealogy Gems Premium. So if you'd like to uh, become a member yourself, if you aren't already, certainly head to genealogygems.com and you can sign up right there. Okay, well, gosh, so much going on. You know, I just got back from Odessa, Texas for a full day seminar at the Permian Basin Genealogical Society. What a nice group of people. Oh my gosh, they were just wonderful. I had catfish for the first time. That was fun. (laughs) It was really good. And then right after that, um, this last week, I went to Kelowna, British Columbia. Gorgeous place. I didn't realize it was so large. I was thinking I was kind of going to a little small place because we were taking a, a puddle jumper plane, a little two prop engine from Vancouver, but it's a beautiful kind of a retirement resort area. Really nice. Had a wonderful time there. Bill got to go with me to that one. And when we wrap up this episode, I'm going to be heading out. We're heading up north to Sumner, Washington to put on a full day seminar up there for the Heritage Quest Library for their autumn conference. So, so much to do, but I don't want to go anywhere until we hear from you. So that's coming up next in the mailbox. particular order. I've just got a pile of emails here. Um, Let me see here. Stephanie uh, wrote in recently with an opinion about ancestry family trees. She says, I am just working my way through the episodes and learning so much along the way. 
Of course, since I am only at episode 109, I'm sure you've discussed this further, but there has been some talk of the incorrect information in public trees. I think she's talking about on Ancestry. So here are my two bits. I am new to all this and honestly never considered my public tree as published. That's a good point. It's not really published work. It's just a work you're sharing online. Okay. And she goes on to say, I have used the Ancestry tree as if it were my workbook, just as if it were a software package like Roots Magic. Because I consider it a workbook, I add names as I find them, and I work the family as a group to document the information after I add them. It simply never occurred to me that others would see this as complete documented information. I have kept my tree open since I want to be open to contacts. When I see hints from other trees, I simply avoid the unsourced ones. The ancestry hints have moved me along much faster than I ever could have before. I truly hope others who get angry could see my point of view. Thank you so much for teaching us. You have made this journey so much more enjoyable and effective. Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, that is awesome to hear. And I got to tell you, I agree with you. I've said it before. They're really clues. Somebody else's tree, somebody else's work in progress are just clues for you. But we have to chase them down, don't we? (laughs) And do all the sourcing. I like the way you put it. It's a lot like an just an online social networking kind of workbook. Okay, fair enough. Good point, Stephanie. And Loretta also wrote in about ancestry trees. She says, I've been catching up on your podcast and just listened to the mailbox section of episode 109. I've had a little different reaction towards the polluted, in quotation marks, online trees. Sarcasm, she says. (laughs) At the beginning of the year, I started a blog. It's called Barking Up the Wrong Tree. I post on Tuesdays and Fridays. Both days could be considered tips for beginners, but Tuesdays are examples of what not to do. All the examples are actual online trees, and because of the propensity of newbies to mindlessly copy other trees, most examples are not just on one tree. It makes for a lot of head meets desk moments, but I'm enjoying it. Hope you and some of your listeners will too. Thanks so much for your podcast. (laughs) Awesome idea, Loretta. Okay, so here's her blog address, buwt.blogspot.com. I'll have that in the show notes. Thank you for sharing that. Interesting. That could that could be a head banging moment, couldn't it occasionally? And from Ashley, she says, I've been listening to all of your family history genealogy made easy podcasts and am slowly but surely making my way through your archive of family tree magazine and genealogy gems podcast. I love the shows. I listen to them at work while doing data entry and it gives me the itch to jump right into research as soon as I get home. Awesome. That means they met their goal. Okay. She says, I have a quick and simple question for you. Just because I'm curious, do you request records for ancestors when you don't necessarily need the record? For example, if you already know the basics about your grandfather's birth, for instance, the date, location, parents, etc., do you request the birth certificate for completion's sake or do you pass on that fee? Keep up the great work and I'm sure you'll hear from me again soon. All right, Ashley. Well, for me... I kind of just have to see everything. So yes, I am pretty much order anything I come across. Um, But you, because you never really know what little gem that you're going to find tucked in amongst data that you you feel you already have or that isn't as critical. There might be just some little clue in there. You'd be amazed how many times I have been surprised. Now, that being said, if I have to choose where money is going to be spent, I will more likely order the item for a more recent relative than one that's much further back in my tree. Uh, Number one, because they're closer to me. And number two, because most recent records tend to have more data in general. Uh, That is just a generality, but that's just me. I'm kind of really interested in in the generations that are even closer to me than, you know, 150 years ago. But there again, comes right down to kind of your priorities and what will be able to continue on the journey that you want to be on. So um, I guess the answer is we get to do what we want to do. And Ricky from Birmingham, Alabama, he wrote in to say, I went for a walk today and I was listening to the Genealogy Gems podcast. During this time, I had a lot of questions pop into my head. Let me preface these questions by saying I am very new to genealogy research. I started in January. 
I have listened to all the Genealogy Made Easy podcast, and now I'm around number 96 on Genealogy Gems. So first question here, source citation. I've ordered a copy of Evidence Explained. I looked at it for the first time this past weekend at the library. My question is, say we're talking about census records. Why would we have to put that we saw the page on Ancestry.com? If we cite that we looked at a certain page or a year and location, would that not give someone coming along after me the information that they need to find the same information? What if the website no longer exists? If I give all of the other information, the future researcher could find what I have found from whatever source, let's say the 1900 census that I saw, just not the same exact method, which of course was ancestry. Well, to answer that question, Ricky, you're absolutely right. You want to cite the source that it actually comes from, the information itself, 1900 census and the details, the enumeration district, the page number, the line number, that kind of thing. I always indicate as well where I got access to that source. And that's really what you're talking about, that method. The access came from Ancestry.com. And so typically I will put either the link or I'll have the actual image number, the, the path by which I found it on Ancestry. But you are absolutely right. Websites are very short term. I mean, look, Ancestry is even looking at being purchased by somebody else. And who knows how things will change. So websites come and go, links come and go. But I figure couldn't hurt to include the path, the address to the on-site location, because that is probably easiest and quickest way to get a hold of that 1900 census. But in the end, the source itself is the 1900 census page itself, whether you looked at it on microfilm or through Amazon or whatever, because you're absolutely right, at least currently, <laughs> you can still go into a family history library and order um, the 1900 census and look it up on, on microfilm or whatever other method they have for delivering it. So um, again, to me, it doesn't hurt to do both. Um, but the absolute priority is the source document itself. And um, certainly, I think you can't go wrong following the way Elizabeth, Elizabeth Schoen Mills covers source citation and evidence explained. That's the way to go. And Ricky's other question here is about paper organization. Did you ever, I haven't gotten to it yet, if so, do a podcast or an article about organizing my genealogy papers? I've heard and tried to start doing a good job um, of hard drive organization, but I have a lot of papers. If you haven't done something on this topic, do you have someone else who has that that you could refer me to? Well, Ricky, I haven't tackled the paper side of it yet. I definitely have my own um, process for doing it. And I've been a little bit hesitant, I guess, to really cover that on the show because, gosh, everybody has their own way. You know, some of us just function better when we look at folders, and some of us really can't think unless everything's in a binder or stacks of paper on our desks. I mean, there's those of us too, right? So lots of different ways to go on that. Um, hard drive organization, what Ricky's talking about are my videos on hard drive organization. There's a two-part video that's part of Genealogy Gems premium membership, which really is a tried and true way to organize your digital files on your hard drive. So you will never lose another file. But I can tell you, for paper, the way I deal with it is with three ring binders. I know some people are going, oh, I don't like three ring binders. <laughs> I get that. For me, that's what works. And I tend to do it chronologically. And I also tend to do it in a way that mirrors what I'm doing in terms of my hard drive organization. The idea being they should reflect each other. So you're not looking into your hard drive and then having to completely turn your brain around trying to look at three ring notebooks that are organized in a different method. So um, that kind of gives you a hint as how, how I do it. And I will give it some serious thought to perhaps even doing a video on that uh, in the coming months in terms of paper organization. And I think that's probably why you aren't finding one you know, all-knowing comprehensive guide to paper organization. Because, well, one thing is genealogy is changing so fast. Uh, also, people do have different learning styles, different organization styles. And boy, if you ever go onto a social network and you see people talking about organizing their papers, you can see heated battles <laughs> raise their heads as people have strong opinions about what the best way to go is. 
So um, for now, you might want to do some Google searches on it and check out the different kinds of variations that you come across and see what just rings your bell that really seems to resonate with you as a method that might work for you as well. But good idea. I will keep that on my radar. Okay. Thank you so much for writing in. Okay, well, stay tuned because coming up right after this, I'm going to be sharing with you some really cool stuff that those of you out there listening have been doing online with Family History Blogging. It's coming up. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I bet he's glad But more than any It's here, the new version 5 of the award-winning Roots Magic genealogy software. It makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easier and more enjoyable than ever. If you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've really been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, then do what I did. I chose Roots Magic, and I'm really glad that I did. Throughout its 10-year history, Roots Magic has helped people research and share their family trees with innovative features like uh, moving people from one file to another with your mouse, a source wizard to help you document your work, creating a shareable CD to give to family and friends, and running Roots Magic off of a USB flash drive when you're away from home. Roots Magic also received the award for easiest to sync from Family Search for their work in interfacing with that system. Really, what are you waiting for? Download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 5 at rootsmagic.com. See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. You know, I've been meaning to do this gem for months now, it seems like, and somehow I just kind of lost track of it. But better late than never. Family history blogging is hotter than ever, and the ideal way to get your research out on the web where other people working on the same family lines can find you through Google searches is by blogging. Now, many of you have been taking advantage of the free blogging services like blogger.com. And of course, mom cooks nagging here on the podcast. Um, I've been nagging you about blogging. And uh, I know some of you have been reaping some really great rewards from doing that. So let me just highlight a few listeners who have turned in their round to it for a get her done badge. First up is David, who started a blog on his St. Croix research. He says, I recently started in my genealogy and find your show both entertaining and helpful. My family history research is an underrepresented geographical area, the U.S. Virgin Islands. These islands were Danish from about 1680 to 1917 when the U.S. purchased them. My family goes back to at least 1746 on the island of St. Croix. Unfortunately, since it isn't either Europe or the U.S., although it is a combination of both, the genealogy world doesn't seem to get around to discussing them, and they are missing from the blogosphere. Following your advice, I am trying to make up for this lack with my own research blog. 200 Years in Paradise, and the blog address is 200inparadise.blogspot.com. He says, the reason I'm writing is that sometimes we forget that the world wasn't homogeneous throughout the 1800s. Right now, I'm writing a series on illegitimate births on the island of St. Croix from 1841 to 1934. 
from my research, it seems that over 77% of the children born were to unmarried households. Typically, they formed stable family units, but they just didn't marry. In fact, in my personal family history, I have a set of ancestors who had 16 children and got married after their 12th child was born. In the U.S. at the same time, only about 4% of the children were illegitimate. I invite you to read my study and the other information that I've posted. Anyway, I wanted to give you a perspective of another place that, while European, was distinctly different. Congratulations, David. That is awesome. And again, his web, his blog is 200inparadise.blogspot.com. Next up is Jennifer, who says, I'm enjoying all the new information you keep coming up with. Not sure how you manage. <laughs> I'm not either, Jennifer. She says, are you one of those people who only needs about four hours of sleep at night? Actually, I'm not. But I am a night owl. But I, I am a big sleeper. I have to have my eight hours. She says, I'm also glad to see that you suggest the use of JedView for an iPad. After a couple of false starts getting the data transferred, it displays very nicely. Just wanted you to know that I've started my own blog based largely on the encouragement in your podcasts. What appealed to me was that it's a medium where I can share information, but not in a way that's an online family tree. This will prevent readers from copying and pasting family tree branches without slowing down to learn some context. It also allows me a forum to correct some gigantic errors floating around out there about my ancestors. I finally woke up to the fact that I've moved to the head of the line in the experience department. I've placed a lot of tags on the entry so the information is easily located in Google. And as you like tips for making use of family memorabilia, I thought you might like to see today's entry. And you will find her blog over at Jen on Jen blogspot.com. And uh, you probably recognize that name. Jen has written in before, but it's J E N O N G E N dot blogspot.com. And next up, Sonia Hunter, she wrote in to share her blogging success. She says, I only became a listener about a year ago, but have been working my way through old genealogy gems podcast, as well as the genealogy made easy podcast, mostly while gardening. I also want to let you know that you inspired me to start blogging. Yay! I rang in the new year by starting a blog about doing genealogy in my hometown of Kalamazoo, Michigan. One primary goal is to highlight helpful area resources, and I imagine this will be most helpful to those new to conducting family history research in the area. In addition, I'm trying to include Kalamazoo area or Michigan history items that I think are interesting. One example is an article I found in the local paper describing that what Kalamazooans from 1884 imagined life would be like in 1984. I've also written about poisonous cheese in the 1880s, diphtheria, and in the case of my great-great-grandfather's brother-in-law, who may or may not have committed suicide by slitting his throat. Ah, I consulted Paula Sassy for that case and planned a blog about her handwriting analysis in the future. Thank you for inspiring me to embark on this project. I'm learning a lot and keep up the good and valuable work that you do in your podcast. Thank you so much. Sonia's blog is called Bushwhacking Genealogy Kalamazoo and Beyond. And it's kalamazoogenealogy.blogspot.com. You guys really find some interesting stuff. You know, and that's really a key, I think, to getting people to stay connected with your blog post. One, she's providing real, helpful, usable information for the area where she focuses, but also some really kind of fun and bizarre stuff, right? Poisonous cheese in the 1880s. I mean, who knew? So interesting stuff. That's a great mix, Sonia. Keep up the great work. And, you know, she mentioned the handwriting analysis. Now, that was Paula Sassy who did that for her. Paula's been here on the show doing handwriting analysis for us. And uh, Sonia's ancestor was John Harrigan. And she did a post called John Harrigan Who Done It. So I'll have a link specifically to that so you could check out what Paula did for Sonia. And from John in Maryland, he says, It's been a while since I contacted you. I want to thank you again for everything you do to inspire people to be enthusiastic about your, their family history. I learned so many gems with all of your resources and put many of them to practice. You are the family history go-to person in my book. Thank you, John. <laughs> 
He says, I recently started a blog for the primary reason of documenting my findings so that I wouldn't forget what I've been discovering. The blog also appears to be a good way to share my success stories with others that might be interested. I credit you for introducing the idea of using a blog in Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. When I first listened to the podcast about blogs, I didn't think it was something that was applicable to me, as I felt I had no new information to share with others, since many experts like yourself already handle this. However, I'm giving it a try, and I enjoy it so far. I really like how I'm able to place images within the text to help convey my information. If you're interested, you may find my blog at recorddetective.blogspot.com. And he's got Record Detective, so there's one D, just to be clear. I'll have it in the show notes for you. He says, I posted your link within my first post. Family history research brings out the detective in me in the off chance that someone may not be aware of all of your gems. If you have any other suggestions as to a better venue to post my stories versus a blog, I'd be interested in hearing about them. I recently heard one of your gems podcasts. It was connected to my download for episode 119, where you interviewed Michael Fairley about a thousand memories site. Oh, Michael, I think it was Michael Katchen, right? From a thousand memories. What website do you think will stand the test of time? Any thoughts on this would be appreciated. Well, interesting that you bring that up the thousand memories, because of course, they just got bought by Ancestry. Now that does mean that it didn't last that long, but it means it may last a whole lot longer because now it's part of a larger, larger organization. We could do a whole segment on websites and their viability into the future. And I, I think it's something that really genealogists have to think about because while the web is a fantastic place to go for data, as well as to post your data, do blogging like you guys are doing, the web isn't perfectly suited for all types of data. And I guess in terms of the purpose of that data, is it for storage? And story, you know, now that the cloud is kind of out, if you will, you know, everybody's using cloud-based services, getting their own kind of little storage tank at a various cloud facility. I wonder what the future will be actually for some of the sites where they're saying, hey, post all your photos here, post all your information here. If you want to do it for sharing, then that makes sense because those websites can help you connect with other people. But if you're doing it mostly for a, as a storage facility, as a way to really get all, let's say, your photographs digitized, then see, I kind of lean towards that self-storage, if you will, the cloud-based services. Why put it in the hands of a company who might buy or sell later down the road and then everything changes? With cloud storage, I think you're going to have more control longer term if you stick with some of the big players that are out there so um it's going to be interesting that that would be a really great topic i'd love to have a google hangout on that and see what all of you guys think but john congratulations on recorddetective.blogspot.com looks great thank you so much for mentioning uh the genealogy gems podcast on your blog and um i think you've got a great vehicle for posting that information keeps you inspired to keep working on it kind of lets you know where you've been and might even connect you with other cousins. So you are on the right track. And finally, Shannon Bennett has really made a blogging splash. Um, she wrote in, I have been hemming and hawing on writing to you and finally took the plunge to do it. Last spring, a friend of mine told me about your podcast. Yes, all of them. <laughs> Since I just started into family research, she thought I would like it. And boy, was she right. I have taken you on my iPod to drop my kids off at school and pick them up again, clean house, grocery shopping, as well as everywhere in between. The wealth of information I've gathered from your podcast have been very helpful, and I've loved all the interviews and tidbits that have come along the way as well. There is no way that I could just pick one out of so many to be my all-time favorite. Maybe a top 10 list would cover it. However, I do have to blame you for the latest adventure in my life, which is why I'm writing. Listening to you tell us in almost every episode about the importance of having a family blog finally sank in. The first couple of times I heard you say it, I thought to myself, well, there's no way I would or could ever do such a thing. I barely have time to keep up with my live journal account. A few weeks went by and the thoughts began to change to, hmm, maybe I could do this. Then after about four months of thinking about it, I started to do some research 
into how to run a successful blog. I'm a preparer, you see. Never jump into anything on a whim if I can help it, which is why what happened next was a bit unbelievable. While out thinking about blogs, I was reading and clicking links online one evening. Up pops a contest announcement from Family Tree University about their Family First blog. I had read the blog and I enjoyed Nancy's post. Reading on, I come to find out that they're looking for their second blogger. I sat. I thought. I clicked the application button. Yes, on a whim, I entered because I thought I had nothing to lose. You see, I never win these types of things. A month goes by, and I have given into the feeling that, well, it was a good try, but of course I didn't get in. Off I go, and in about two hours' time, I've created my family blog. I advertise it to all my friends and family and ask them to check it out. That evening... I get an email stating that I am a finalist for the Family Tree First blog. Then later on that week, I found out I won. So thank you. I would have never entered, let alone thought about creating my own blog, less than a year into my family research, without you and your wonderful podcast. And that's from Shannon Bennett. Her blog is Trials and Tribulations of a Self-Taught Family Historian. (laughs) I love that title. It's TNT Family History. Blogspot.com. And Family Tree First Blog. And congratulations, Shannon. That is amazing. You'll find that at FamilyTreeUniversity.com. And I'll have a link to get you straight into Shannon's blog posts. But, Shannon, you are like the poster child for genealogists and why we should blog. You're exactly what I'm talking about. Here's the thing it's like I said. You can wait for a round to it, or you can just get her done. And sometimes we just have to put it out there. Nothing can come back to us if we don't put it out there, right? And that's what Shannon, John, Jen, and Sonia have been doing. Put it out there. It's not that hard. You don't have to be a professional writer. You don't have to have hours and hours. It's about... Even just write a little paragraph, a little something. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of people out there. If I've learned nothing from doing this podcast, is there are so many folks out there, just like me, who love family history, who like a little bit of inspiration, like a little bit of a few gems now and then, right? And um, who like to know that they're not by themselves doing this. And sometimes we can feel that way when we're sitting at our own computer. We don't get out and about as much anymore because so much is online. But not everything's online. We know that. So meeting up at conferences like we talked about, Roots Tech, getting our blogs out there, just putting a few words out there to let people know what we're up to. It makes for a much more enjoyable family history experience. Congratulations to all the new family history bloggers. And uh, sorry it took me so long. Talk about needing a round to it. Did this time go? I don't know. This is the end of Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 142. I'm just finishing up my packing, heading up north to Sumner, Washington. And then to the holidays, um, I've got a daughter to move. Uh, She's moving out on her own. And uh, new grandbabies to rock and more ancestors to find. And more talking to you. That's one of my favorite things. And if you would like to have some of your favorite things a little more easily accessible to you, consider getting the Genealogy Gems toolbar if you haven't already. It's free, okay? F-R-E-E, free. You can download it from the homepage at genealogygems.com. I built it because I knew there were other people like you, like me, who want quicker access to the sites that we're going to on a regular basis, who might also like to listen to the podcast and, frankly, Sometimes listening to podcasts can be a little challenging when you're first new to it, right? Wasn't it kind of hard to figure out iTunes and, you know, links and we change how we set it up. It's just, you know, craziness. So 
there's a little media player on the toolbar. There's a little button for Google Earth. You can do pinning and Pinterest. Uh, you can check out my blog, be one click to the videos, one click to the website. All the resources that you need, I hope, to stay motivated and to stay researching. So it's the Genealogy Gems toolbar, absolutely free at genealogygems.com. Sometimes it's easy to miss because you have to scroll down the home page and you'll find the graphic for it down on the left hand side. It's like a gold bar. And it's just one little strip of tools just for genealogists that will attach itself to your browser. When you click the graphic, um, you'll get to the download page, scroll down again one more time and pick the graphic for the browser that you use. Then you'll be sure to get the toolbar version that's right for your browser, whether it's Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, whatever it is that you're using. I hope that comes in handy. I want you to be able to easily be able to find what you want and be able to listen to the show at the same time. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.